You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to a Bible answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. I serve as the moderator of this program. This program is overseen by the elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and by a large number of congregations throughout the region who financially support this program and allow us to bring it to you. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. I'm Bill Brandstetter. I preach for the Marion, Illinois Church of Christ. I'm Daryl Simon. I preach for the Harrisburg Church of Christ in Harrisburg, Illinois. I'm Gerald Cowan. I preach for the DuCoin Church of Christ, DuCoin, Illinois. So glad these brethren from Illinois could be with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Cowan. In Matthew 19, 28, how and when will the apostles judge the 12 tribes of Israel? Brother Cowan. This uh, is an intricate, rather complex question, but I thank you for the opportunity to answer it. First, realize that these are not literal living apostles on literal material thrones in some judgment court. We have difficulty when we talk about or read about uh, judgment and judges. We think in terms of our courtroom system, where a judge hears evidence and renders a verdict uh, at the end of the given evidence. Nothing like that is going to happen. Jesus says, and I, I think it might be worth reading again to you, Jesus said to them, I tell you truly, verily I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The regeneration, what is that? Israel was uh, dismissed from the continuing purpose of God and replaced by the church of Jesus Christ. The regeneration of Israel became the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sits now upon the throne of his glory as the ultimate judge, the ultimate ruler of his church. And we're not talking here about some future church uh, as in the premillennial concept where, where Christ will sit on the throne for a thousand years ruling over the church. Nothing like that. When he says, when I am enthroned, then you will in some sense be enthroned with me. And when I judge Israel, you will in some sense be judging with me. And by the way, the, um, the, the promise is not just to the apostles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says that um, we, all saints, all Christians, all of us who are in Christ and with Christ, all of us will in some sense be judges of others. He said, we will judge the world. Chapter 6, verse 3, we will judge angels. If we are to judge the world and judge angels, how will that be done? Not by sitting on the throne, a judgment seat, and having them pass by and give evidence and rendering some sort of verdict. I, I think that perhaps what Paul has in mind here is that for those who say, Christianity is impossible. The answer to that is, it's not impossible. Look at us who are Christians. For those who say you can't satisfy God, well, look at us. We have satisfied him. We please him. You can't be saved by anything you do. Well, look at us. We have been saved by obeying the Christ and doing his will and his word. The apostles were sent into the world to teach, to preach, to inform people, and to organize people into a proper response to the gospel message that Christ gave them to preach. 
one had to do what the apostles taught in order to satisfy the Lord who sent them. So the question would be something like this. Are you doing what the apostles of Christ, by the authority of Christ, have taught you to do? Are you living the way they have taught you to live? If you are, then you are acceptable. You are approved. And if you are not, then you are disreproved, uh, disproved and, uh, and not acceptable. So the apostles and their teaching, or their role as teachers and judges in that sense, is very easy to understand. And the same thing is true with you and me, ordinary Christians. We prove by living a proper kind of life. We prove by having a pure mind and conscience in our response to God. We prove that it not only is doable, but that it's being done in us and should be done in others that we can teach and lead to Christ. This is not about some future nation, <clears throat> pardon me, not a reconstituted nation of Israel. There, there's that doctrine being taught by some, that Israel must be reconstituted, reorganized, regenerated, and that there will be physical thrones and uh, living physical rulers on those thrones and so on. That's not the point here at all. It was to continue not only for the time that these men were still alive, that Jesus is speaking to, but for all time until he comes again. Now, notice he said, when I sit on my throne, then you also will be on thrones of judgment. But you know, he makes that same kind of promise to us, not just the apostles, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, Jesus said, To him who overcomes, the one who overcomes, the one who is successful in keeping the word and the will of God, the one who is faithful to the end of his life, will sit down with me as an overcomer. But where is he going to sit? He said, As I sat down with my father in his throne, you will sit down with me in my throne we too will be known as overcomers, judges who prove by the end of our lives that what the Lord asks is not only doable, but is being done, and we're the living proof of it. You want to know whether you can do what the Lord says? Look at us. We're doing it. it it's a, a, a bit parallel, isn't it, to Hebrews chapter 11, what is called the hall of faith or the Hall of the Faithful, all of these people are in some sense witnesses. Now, they're not watching what you do, and they're not whispering in your ear about what you ought to do. They can say, and they do say, you can do it. We are the proof that you can do it. And of course, they would say if they could speak to us, and we would say to others if we could speak to them, you can do it, and we want you to do it, and we'll show you how to do it. Do it just the way we've done it and the way we are doing it. And together we will show the world and everything contrary to God and His Christ. We will show them the proof that His way is not just the right way and the doable way, but it is the only way that you're ever going to please Him. Our job is to please God, not please ourselves, not please some other human judge, but to please God. And I hope that you, whoever you are, who ask questions like this, are trying to be right with Him. Thank you for a very good question. Thank you. Now to Brother Brandstatter, we have this question. Does the husband of one wife, 1 Timothy 3.12, mean that a man who is remarried after being widowed or scripturally divorced cannot serve as an elder? Brother Brandstatter. Thank you for this very good question. First of all, 1 Timothy 3.12 refers to the deacons being the husband of one wife. But let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality, and apt to teach. 
often in selection of elders or when a man is appointed an elder and then his wife dies and then he remarries. This question comes up. We've had this discussion in Bible classes. Uh, no doubt many people have discussed it privately. What about this husband and one wife? I want to look at this passage. I want to look at the subsequent passage in Titus chapter 1, which tells us a little bit more about what's being said here. Let's look at the original language and then let's apply it. First of all, it says he must be blameless, the husband of one wife. I want you to notice that word blameless, above reproach or beyond reproach is what it really means. Let's look over at Titus 1. Titus gives us a little more indicator as to what's being said here. He adds the word blameless onto the whole family situation. Notice he must be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So this blameless or above reproach indicates how is that man regarding a family man? And when I was at the Memphis School of Preaching, our Greek teacher used to tell us that basically what this is being said here is that he's a one woman man. He's faithful to his wife. And all men ought to be faithful to their wives. All men ought to be a one woman man in that sense. You know, there are three people who can get married in God's sight and their marriage be acceptable. One is a person who's never been married before. Jesus said that a man would leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. The second is Romans chapter 7, the one whose mate has died, they're no longer under the law of their husband and they can remarry. And the third is the one whose mate has committed fornication as Jesus said in Matthew 19 verse 9. Those three are scripturally married in the sight of God. So. When a man is scripturally married and he's faithful to his one wife, he is, in a sense, the husband of one man. But, but or rather, he's the, he's the husband of one wife. Now, let's, let, let's look at this from another point of view. In, Titus 1, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9, there's a statement made about a widow who was under three score. And so she's a widow. And the text says having been the wife of one man. Now the word having been is added by the translators. The original Greek says she was a widow, the woman of one man. Notice she's still identified as the woman of one man even though her husband has already died. Again, the emphasis Titus in Titus's, in Paul's letter to Titus, the emphasis he places in Romans 1.6 is that the man who is an elder is above reproach. He's blameless in that regards. He is, as my Greek teacher told me, a one woman man. Uh, that's what the text says. So if a person is scripturally married in God's sight and is a one woman man, is faithful to the one he's married to, then the way the text reads out, he is scripturally qualified to be an elder. Or in the case of the question also, 1 Timothy 3.12, the same terminology, a deacon. Let's remember what uh, was written in Hebrews 13, verse 4. Let marriage be, marriage is honorable among all, but, whor but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You know, the qualification of elders, all but four of the qualification of elders ought to characterize every Christian man. And one of them is that he's the husband of one wife. Thank you very much for this very good question. Thank you to Brother. Uh, well, we have a, a break now. We want to offer to you a free track as we've reached our halfway point today. And that track is entitled, Does It Matter Which Church I Attend? And then as we do each week, we're offering a free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course. We'll send you the first lesson. Study it with your Bible. Send it back to us. We'll grade it and send you lesson two. And if you complete all eight lessons, you will receive a certificate of completion. So if you'd like any of our free materials or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by means of our contact page on our website, www.abibleanswertv.org. You can reach us by email at abibleanswer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll-free number, 1-800-436- 0463. We're always in need of Bible questions, so we hope you'll use, utilize one of these means to reach us and send in your Bible question. And now for Brother 
Daryl Simon's first question on today's program. Someone says, are we really wearing our best for the Lord when we attend worship services? In shorts and jeans with holes in them and the vulgar leggings that are being worn now with tops so short that everything is seen on the body. Brother Simon. I want to mention a couple of uh, verses here uh, at the very beginning uh, concerning worship itself. One is from the Old Testament and the other from the New. In Psalm 29 in verse 2, the psalmist writes, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And then I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John chapter 4 and verse 24, where Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I think the way I would like to address uh, this particular question uh, is that fathers, should be the spiritual leaders in their homes. I'm reminded in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 that the Bible says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers training in the home should talk to their sons and their daughters about proper dress, not only in worship, but at all times. And if the father makes the decision in the home concerning how he would like his son or daughter to be dressed, those children should obey their fathers. Just uh, back a few verses in chapter 6 of Ephesians, we read in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it's written in verse 2, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Concerning uh, dress in worship, I think something that uh, we could certainly emphasize uh, in regard to that, is being respectful uh, in our dress. And then is uh, this dress distracting? Is it uh, calling attention to myself? Or is it uh, distract, distracting uh, someone else in their worship? I may have the right to dress in a particular way in worship, but what if that uh, way of dress is being uh, distractful to someone else? Maybe uh, that person uh, even brings some objection to how I, I'm dressed to my attention. I think certainly I ought to think about that. I want to be respectful in the way I dress when I come to worship, and I certainly want to be uh, respectful unto God. I think also of the fact that the New Testament uh, speaks to the elders uh, and of the elders in the church, that the elders are the managers, they are the shepherds, they are the uh, overseers in the church. And certainly if an elder sets up uh, some principle of dress in worship, whereby one that serves should uh, look uh, a, a certain way, they have uh, that right to do that. But I do want to say that we ought to uh, uh, be very cautious. Uh, too quick to judge uh, someone just because they uh, may be wearing uh, jeans that are holy, I, I think is not necessarily a reflection upon that person. Do I want to judge that person in some way? Do I want to be very harsh and critical of that individual for dressing in that way so that I might even drive them away from the church? Certainly not. Uh, I would never want to do that. I would not uh, want you to do uh, that. In regard to the uh, part of the 
a question that I think concerns uh, modesty. It should not only be uh, an answer given as a result of worship, but uh, also because of everyday life. And here it's uh, mentioning uh, a woman and uh, how uh, she has dressed when she comes to worship. Let's consider what 1 Timothy chapter 2 uh, says about modesty. In verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Again, what does the dress say about an individual that uh, dresses uh, in a way that's not modest? Is there uh, shame in that? Uh, do you at all feel that uh, because of that dress, it's suggesting that you're not living in a holy way? Let's just uh, be very concerned about what the Bible says about modesty. And that applies as far as holy living is concerned uh, to both uh, men and women in God's church. Again, I want to say uh, that I would handle a situation like this very gently uh, with a, a spirit of meekness, with a, a spirit of kindness and courtesy. Uh, would I dare say something to someone who has taken the time to come to worship, uh, something uh, that might offend them and drive them away from their worship of God? So let's be very careful uh, when it comes with dealing with this matter. Uh, I appreciate the question very much. Thank you. And now to Brother Cowan. In one of Jesus' parables, the host at a wedding feast expelled a man for coming without the appropriate garment. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. What does this parable and principle teach us about God's expectations? Brother Cowan. I have a good friend, a preacher in Scotland, and I've heard him say uh, on this subject that Daryl was just talking about, you know, people come dressed as they want to be dressed. If I feel good about it, then that's, that's all that counts. He said those who come with tatters and rags come because designer tat is in. Those rags, those tatters are designed to look just like they look. Are, are we concerned about um, what other people think or what, what the Lord thinks? Now, it overlaps somewhat into, into my question here. The king came in to a wedding celebration and he noticed that there was a man there who did not have on a wedding garment, a proper wedding garment, and he asked him, how can you come in here without being properly dressed for this? And the man had no answer. He was speechless. We understand about appropriate dress for certain occasions. Uh, so you don't dress quite the same for a funeral as you would for a wedding or some other social event. We wear appropriate clothing. Is that what he's talking about? It's not you ought to wear something that is appropriate for the situation, but rather wear what is required for the situation. The wedding garment, what was it? It was something, by tradition for that time, something provided by, in this case, the Father, that all of the guests would wear. It was some item that would identify them as wedding guests, but more than that, would honor the Son and His bride and the Father who was providing the occasion. There are three things. Uh, in spiritual application, that the wedding garment can be. First, it can be salvation. Christ saves us. We don't save ourselves. We cooperate with Him so that He can save us, but salvation is from the Lord. How can you come in here when you are not saved by the Lord according to His Word? 
And a second thing is it could be the righteousness of Christ which is provided to those whom he has saved and who are his people. Dressed in his righteousness, Paul says, not my own. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. One cannot enter into the kingdom dressed in the presumed righteousness of his own way. You can't say, well, I'm okay, I do what pleases me, and therefore I must be acceptable. It's not your righteousness, rather it's his that you must be dressed in. And the third, and I think this is really the critical thing, it is to be dressed in Christ, to be dressed with Christ. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Paul says this, We are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, because as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, now we're clothed with Christ. There isn't any, anything to separate us, to differentiate us from other wedding guests. We're all one and the same. We're all marked with the same Christ, the same righteousness, and our same obedient spirit. Everybody must be able to account to God for whether he has or has not obeyed the gospel of Christ. If he hasn't, he has no excuse. He'll be speechless when he's asked. If he has not done it, and there is still time to do it, now the parable here doesn't talk about going out and getting a proper item of clothing. The question is, why didn't you prepare for this properly before you came? Thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Brother Cowan, for that very good answer. We appreciate these brethren for the good job that they've done today in answering these questions. I want to make this one remark. Uh, there's a congregation called the Neboville Church of Christ near Yorkville, Tennessee. We're always sad when a congregation is no longer meeting, but that's the case with Neboville. They're no longer meeting, and they notified us of that. Well, they have supported this program for many, many years, and we want to let them know how much we appreciated their support over the years. And in addition to that, I want to extend my thanks to another congregation that supports us, and that's the Doris Chapel congregation, which is sort of near Neboville, across the country, across the fields. And not only are they continuing their support as they've done, but they're also picking up what Neboville had been doing in addition to what they normally do. My, how much we appreciate their thoughtfulness and their willingness to do that for us. Thanks also to the Somerville, Tennessee congregation for being a new supporter of our program. Thank you for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.